Antonio Gerapito, by the way, just recently uh, helped and volunteered his time uh, for benefit for the Mass Coalition for the Homeless. It was the fourth annual uh, Pumpkin Lady Ball at the Channel. And we, the feature there was a funny rate. And some of us, Paco was there, Billy Bonham, some other friends. And uh, we were able to see for the first time the literary arts presented as part of that performance. Uh, Antonio Jarrett did that. And he's with us tonight in our open feature. So, Antonio, here you go. <laughs> Uh, this is very appropriate after that poem about the pigs, because pigs stick you quite well in this piece. Just recently, I came across a poem by Elizabeth Bishop uh, called the, the Prodigal Son. And it uh, stops where he makes up his mind to go home. So I decided, I was inspired by it, and I decided to pick him up where he makes up his mind to go home and take him home. So that's what this is. The Return of the Prodigal Son in Memory of Elizabeth Fisher. Once he had decided he had had enough, that stern recriminations from his father, the brother's scorn, secret contempt of servants were preferable to face than one more day contesting with those snouts for muddy slops. He pulled himself to and grimly left his staff. The negative security he craved when irresponsible he came to this, going the way that they had all predicted when his ever doting father had given in. How he had longed for freedom, in premature, to fulfill his need to get away, to live in a big town, to become someone. For instant gratification, the real excitement, he had to have all of his portion now, when and how he wanted it, and no postponement. He could not afford to wait for his father's death. You have to depend on hostile older brother who was ambitious and resented him, having to share the substance of the estate. He knew him clever and not to be trusted. Whatever he did get would seem like charity. He gave the sty one backward look, disgusted, angry with himself for having demeaned himself enough to beg from dirty peasants, remembering having been a golden <coughs> His feet, more than his brain, still knew the way, not without reluctance and embarrassment, but his gut could argue eloquently, more than the last shred of an immature pride. Then he at last arrived at the familiar gate, fell down in a filthy heap, tried to decide whether to be bold or continue groveling. But before he could, his father's swine herd saw and after scrutiny recognized that stinking mass of rags and misery to be in fact the son of his dear master. At once he left the herd to nuzzle there and ran to tell him that the son for whom he and most of the family were still mourning 
lay like a leper at the outer gate. The father, quick forgetting dignity, anger, and the pain that he had suffered, as well as promises to the eldest son, loyal, whose devotion had sustained him through dull despair, almost distasteful living, whose filial correctness had deserved his father's blessing and the whole estate, ran like a stripling to the courtyard, <coughs> calling out the name of his beloved son, so long thought dead, now suddenly back home. Here in his gate, hospitable to beggars, he found him, gathered him to his breast, and long embraced him. The father's tears, streaking the dirt on his face, revealed his hungry, hunted eyes, and something deeper. He could not remember seeing there before a depth that only suffering synthesizes. And he forgave this remnant of a dream gone wrong and bankrupt, youth's impulsive way, easy to comprehend, but hard enough for a just man to swallow, and harder still for a dutiful brother to accept as fair. Into the house they carried him, had him washed, Sob put on all his scabs, then richly dressed, the beloved son returned, a prosperous father. Excitement ran like rumor. The swineherd wept to witness such compassion in a master. The father then ordained a splendid feast to celebrate the rebirth of a son who had disgraced himself, now penitent. The fatted calf, saved for the grand occasion, was promptly slaughtered, the best wine jars broached, and music summoned to enhance the feasting. Only the brother sulked, grumbling, on seeing his younger, profligate, wastrel brother fetid, honored as if he had done something great, but he had only consumed his own in riot, now come back for more, which must of course be taken from his store, but he had hard earned in his absence. The family all assumed the proper smiles because the father had exhorted them to give their flesh and blood a welcome home, though any excuse for feasting was enough. To all appearances, the prodigal had triumphed, but knowing himself unworthy, felt despised. He had observed the look, the bitter sneer, the mask of hatred on his brother's face. Grandly apparelled as he was, the irony of his position overwhelmed him wholly. His misery was of a subtler sort, corrosive in his gut, and still condemning. He quit the banquet for a breath of air. Leaning against the wall, he up his dinner. The sour taste remained with his shame. His self-disgust made lead run down through his veins. Not even in the pits, down there competing with those grunting snouts, could he recall feeling so despicable and wretched. Wiping his mouth on the embroidered sleeve, he cast himself and slowly went to bed. Thank you.